compañeras, compañeros, les pedimos que se vayan acomodando porque ya en un minuto empezamos. Bueno, compañeras, compañeros, antes de empezar vamos a dar las indicaciones técnicas fundamentalmente para... On the bottom of your screen, you might see an icon, a globe icon, in which you can choose whichever language you want to hear the meeting in, either English, Spanish, or Portuguese. Thank you. If you were able to hear the instructions, please send us a message through the chat. ¿Cómo va a ser? ¿Quién va a arrancar? Bueno, compañeras, compañeros. Hey, Vamos a dar inicio a la conversatoria internacional de la Socialist League. Lenin, 100 años, es la legacia. Y creo que es importante llevar esta actividad. We should know that there's not only comrades participating from the countries the panelists are from of Pakistan and Australia, but in, in many other countries, this talk is being transmitted as well. People will be following, listening to this talk in Spanish online through YouTube of uh, the IS, ISO YouTube channel on the ISO Facebook channel and in Portuguese in the Revolución Socialista Facebook page to write the order of the panelists. I want to especially thank Sandra, who is one of the panelists, because it's eight in the morning in Australia of Saturday, and Imran, for whom it is 2 a.m. in Pakistan. Bueno, sin más preámbulos. La so, without further ado, our proposal is for Sandra to begin, then Comrade Imran, and then Comrade Sandro, who is sitting next to me. So if Sandra will be ready in a minute, we can begin. Like we were saying before, Whoever wishes to do so, after the talk, we have many uh, materials, texts by Lenin in our bookshop here. So, whoever is interested can take these home with them with more eagerness to know more about 
continue to politicize ourselves. You can also follow the Montaña editorial on social media and, of course, the ISL social media that shows the intervention of the ISL in over 30 countries, all continents, where we have comrades that are organized and built this very important tool, which is the international organization. Okay. We are resolving a technical issue, so we just need a minute to begin. We'll continue briefly. Bueno, ya todo listo, ahora nuevamente agradecerles a quienes están acá presentes. Okay, so everything is ready now. Once again, I want to thank everyone participating. This talk, Lenin, 100 years, a legacy and validity. We ask for silence because the... Comrade Sandra Bloodworth will speak now uh, from Socialist Alternative Australia. After her, 
uh, Imran from Pakistan will speak. You ready for me to start? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. I didn't know I was going to be first. Um, <clears throat> I've never done a forum like this before, so I hope my English is um, clear. Well, I thought I'd start with a comment that was found in the secret police records of Russia that I think Lenin would be very proud of. It said, the most energetic and audacious element ready for tireless struggle for resistance and continual organization is that element who are concentrated around Lenin. Now I started with this because in this introduction, I said that I would outline my analysis of Lenin's theory of the revolutionary party. The most controversial, I think, and uh, possibly the least understood of his practice, but also a fundamental aspect of his theory and practice. So I'll touch on some of the criticisms of Lenin and the Bolsheviks, but I won't have time to go into much detail. So Lenin's approach to building that party can only really be understood, I would argue, in the totality of his thought and activity. And I'd uh, argue that there is no timeless Leninist party. There's no blueprint spelled out in what is to be done, written in 1901, as many argue. Lenin's ideas developed with experience. When circumstances changed, so did his strategy, tactics, and the particular way the party was organized. And from his experience in the mass strikes of the mid 1890s, Lenin as a young man concluded that as Marx and Engels argued, workers could emancipate themselves. But also he very early on began to see that this wasn't an automatic process. And he concluded that Marxists need to intervene in struggles to defeat the influence of bourgeois ideas, to take the struggle to the highest level possible and to develop workers' class consciousness. So in what is to be done, Lenin argued it was now time for Marxists to build a more serious, cohered organization, because the, what they had was fairly uh, disorganized. He argued for a democratic, disciplined party united around clear, consistent politics so that you could debate out what to do and carry it out. Now, many of Lenin's enemies argue that in what is to be done, he proposed that revolutionaries should build a party of intellectuals, but they're wrong. He aimed to develop worker intellectuals. And in the revolution of 1905, the small layer of worker intellectuals which had been trained and educated in small discussion circles, like the one he joined in 1893, could now lead wider layers of newly emerging worker activists. And with the democratic reforms won by the revolutionary struggle of 1905, Lenin argued to open up the tight structures of their illegal groups, to establish elected leadership committees, and to involve wider layers of radicalizing workers in them. And the revolution confirmed what Lenin had learned in the workers' struggles of the 1890s. And he, he always emphasized the advances that workers make once the passivity of normal times is broken. So in 1915, addressing students, he would argue, only struggle educates the ex exploited class. Only struggle discloses to it the magnitude of its own power, widens its horizon, enhances its abilities, clarifies its mind, forges the will. But after the exhilaration and advances of the revolution, defeat and counter-revolution in 1907 created new challenges. Revolutionaries could not just march on in a straight line from the changes they'd made to the party. And Lenin outlined the situation. It is precisely because Marxism is not a lifeless dogma, not a completed, ready-made, immutable doctrine, but a living guide to action that it was bound to reflect the astonishingly abrupt change in the conditions of social life. He went on to say that change, that change was reflected in profound disintegration and disunity and a very serious internal crisis of Marxism. 
because the intellectuals became embroiled in debating what he regarded as the most abstract and general philosophical fundamentals of Marxism, which he said had a prevalence of empty phrase mongering. Now, coming to grips with these developments led to a serious debate amongst the Bolsheviks and uh, some of the very rare expulsions that they ever experienced under Lenin. But Lenin sees the retreat of the masses quite differently from the intellectuals' disarray. He concludes that the millions who sprang into action could not continue at the heights that they attained in the revolution. They need, needed a respite in which they were digesting uh, lessons of unparalleled richness, he writes, which will make it possible for incomparably wider masses again to march forward, but now more firmly, more consciously, more confidently, and more steadfastly. In other words, the lessons learned in 1905 would stand them in good stead for the struggles to come. The Bolsheviks were also divided about whether to have an illegal organization as well as making use of the limited rights that they'd won. And Lenin called the opponents of going back, back underground liquidationists because he thought that they wanted a softer, less revolutionary orientation. He argued that they had to learn to work illegally, but also to have an underground section. Now, an Australian Marxist who researched all those early study circles that Lenin participated in and his ideas as they developed showed that the worker activists who had joined the Bolsheviks during the revolution were their stable base until the next upsurge in struggle in 1912 when they formed a party distinct from the Mensheviks. Now, in an analysis um, of the strikes of 1905 to 6, we get a feel for Lenin's developing ideas. He's struck by the dramatic difference between the number of days on strike by the most advanced and well-organized metal workers and the least organized. And he notes that the metal workers slogans were generally more political and audacious. Their endurance and tenacity meant that they could inspire and lead broader masses of workers. And he concludes from this, the political consciousness of the advanced contingent is manifested in its ability to organize. By organizing, he argues, it achieves unity of will and this united will of an advanced thousand, hundred thousand, million becomes the will of the class. We get a feel um, for Lenin's writing style. And he says, the less wavering there is within the party, the more varied, rich, richer and more fruitful will be the influence of the party on the masses surrounding it. So it's arguing against any idea of some broad formation with all kinds of ideas together. Now, Lenin expands on this as well by saying that my argument is that in all countries, everywhere and always, there exists in addition to the party, a broad section of people close to the party. And he refers to the German Social Democratic Party which with a million members were about one fifteenth of the proletariat with 4,250,000 who voted for them, uh, constituting broad sympathetic layers which surrounded the party and who could be expected to mobilize when struggles broke out. And so the party, he concludes, is the politically conscious advanced section of the class. It is its vanguard. The strength of that vanguard is 10 times, 100 times, more than 100 times greater than its numbers. Now, Lenin developed a political analysis of the Soviets or workers' councils, which sprang up in 1905. And he emphasized the important role that they can play in drawing the vast mass of the population behind the working class in revolution. They created a forum in which the masses and all their organizations could participate in debates and decisions about the struggles. They provide a forum in which revolutionaries can argue their case to workers influenced by the moderate socialists and others. And as the organization of the vanguard, the party is both part of and at times separate from the mass of workers, both impacting on the other in a dialectical relationship. So he writes, the relationship of the party to the class differs in different countries, 
depending on historical and other conditions. So for instance, small groups may only be capable of abstract propaganda during uh, lulls in the struggle. But he says, in the history of revolutions, the masses enter the political arena as active combatants, learning in practice, feeling their way, defining their objectives, testing themselves, and testing the theories of their ideologists. In other words, the leadership are tested once workers are um, you know, involved in mass struggle. And 1905 was a striking example of this process that he outlined. There was no theory of Soviets, workers, uh, that uh, before the revolution. Uh, all we had was the Paris Commune, which was less developed than you know, the mass workers' organisations possible by um, 1917, 1905. And so, but workers created them in the process of making the revolution, but then Marxists had to learn how to relate to the Soviets and then draw theoretical conclusions from the experience. Okay, well, by the upsurge in workers' struggles in 1912, the Bolsheviks had established a party with the largest number of workers worker members in Russia by intervening where they could in the unions, in parliamentary elections, political campaigns, and at the same time maintaining a section that were in uh, that were underground. And Lenin was heartened by what he called the Bolshevik mass worker. He argued that the party was strengthened because the numbers of workers compared to intellectuals grew significantly and that work on the local level has passed to a remarkable degree, he said, into new hands, into the hands of a new generation of party workers. I mean, all these um, quotes from Lenin, all that he wrote, are a rebuff to those who say that Lenin just wanted intellectuals to dominate the movement. Now, theory for Lenin, as we've already seen really, the way he approached the Soviets, wasn't some academic act exercise. Every theoretical innovation by Lenin was a political intervention into a specific situation. So just for instance, after the socialist parties in the second international by and large supported their own ruling classes when war broke out in 1914, Lenin's analysis of the world system of imperialism deepened. And he concluded that the Russian revolution would be part of worldwide socialist revolutions. His return to studying Marx and Engels was critical for writing his State and Revolution. He reinstated Marx's actual argument that workers would have to smash the capitalist state, not try to use it as had increasingly become orthodoxy in the Second International. But it's not enough to just aim to smash the state as anarchists argue, he, he uh, said, in order to expropriate and crush the bourgeoisie, the Soviets, and in Russia it involved Soviets of workers, soldiers and peasants, must form a new state which would be truly democratic. In one of his first letters to the Bolshevik leaders from exile after the February Revolution in 1917, Lenin described the Soviet of workers' deputies as the embryo of a workers' government, the representative of the interests of the entire mass of the poor, i.e. of nine-tenths of the population, which is striving for peace, bread, and freedom. And then when he arrived in Russia, in his first speech that he made, he horrified the moderates and stunned even many of the Bolshevik leaders when he um, raised the slogan against the provisional government, all power to the Soviets. And so then he had to convince the party members of what needed to be done. And his arguments were based on a solid analysis of the situation. He argued that the provisional government and its moderate socialists who dominated the Soviets would not stop the war or implement the reforms that the workers, soldiers and peasants had risked so much for. Workers would come to see the need for the Soviets to take power through a combination of that experience and the Bolsheviks' arguments. And he argued, we are not charlatans. We must base, our, base ourselves only upon the consciousness of the masses. We must not be afraid to be a minority. We will carry on the work of criticism in order to free the masses from deceit. Our line will prove right. 
So then the, the, the uh, strength of the Bolsheviks was to base their actions on these concrete analysis and to be very flexible. So in response to the reaction, after the premature attempt at an uprising in July, when basically the provisional government tried to outline the Bolsheviks, Lenin addressed detailed patient arguments to the worker militants on why they needed to drop the slogan, all power to the Soviets. He wrote, it is not a question of Soviets in general on which a new state needs to be built, but of combating the present counter-revolution and the treachery of the present Soviets. The substitution of the abstract for the concrete is one of the greatest and most dangerous sins in a revolution. The slogan calling for the transfer of power to the Soviets, he argued, might be constituted as a simple appeal for the transfer of power to the present Soviets, but this would mean deceiving the people and nothing is more dangerous than deceit. So he understood that, and as you know, it was an important point for Marx is that Soviets, like any other institution, do not exist separate from human consciousness and intervention. No organizational form thrown up in the struggle can automatically ensure victory over capitalism. They had to defeat the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries and win majority support for the Bolsheviks' arguments before they were to raise the slogan again. And then by the end of September, when they were winning majorities in the elections for the Soviets, he argued mercilessly against the hesitancy of the party leadership. His study of Hegel during the war had made him conscious that moments in history do not last indefinitely. If they did not act, he argued the preparedness to confront the state, the enthusiasm for Soviet power would evaporate. And he warned the masses would conclude that the Bolsheviks were no better than all the other prevaricating socialists. So I just want to make a few more points and finish. So Lenin argued that class consciousness for workers means recognizing their potential historical role in society as distinct from other classes. It's not just about being good class militants and prepared to fight their bosses. And this awareness can only be developed, he always argued, on a widespread scale by a combination of struggle and argument. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the role of the party is not just a passive ideological one of propaganda. It has to play an, an interventionist role, organizing and attempting to take every struggle to the highest level possible. Neither is it a party that just it, all it does is intervene to, you know, as militant workers. They have to combine leading the militancy, the actions that can uh, teach people and develop their ideas as well as an ideological intervention. And at every turning point, the party has to be able to analyze the concrete social, economic and political situation to assess the mood of masses of workers of broader layers in order to orient correctly. Trotsky said of them, the Bolsheviks did not exaggerate success. They did not bend the truth of events to satisfy their own arguments. The school of Lenin, he wrote, was a school of revolutionary realism. So I would argue that it's these politics, not the particular ways that they organize the party, which is a distinctive contribution to revolutionary theory and practice by Lenin and the Bolsheviks. Now, Lenin's critics argue that he built a party that was undemocratic, dogmatic, reductionist, narrow and sectarian. But in reply to them, very briefly, I would say, again and again, Lenin strongly argues the need for the party to take up the struggle against every form of oppression, religious persecution, women's oppression, national oppression, political and cultural oppression of artists and writers. Were they sectarian? Well, I, one example I would raise is that the fact is only the Bolsheviks were capable of leading a united coalition of all those who wanted to defend the revolution against Kornilov's attempted counter-revolutionary coup in August 1917. No one else could unite everyone. The Bolsheviks won a majority in the Soviets for a second revolution in October, I would argue, because they learned to articulate the desires of the masses and they won their confidence to take power into their own hands. 
so to finish. I'd argue that the key to Lenin's theory of the party, the link which unites theory and practice, tactics and principles, which illuminates the kind of party that we need to build, was his absolute confidence in the ability of the working class to overthrow capitalism and a single-minded commitment to that revolution. And I would argue a lot of the critics of Lenin and the Bolsheviks do not hold that commitment and therefore they cannot understand his politics and they cannot come up with an alternative. And I'm not sure if I, I think I have possibly half a minute because if I, I thought I might give the last word to Trotsky, even though he only joined Lenin in 1917, but given he was the key figure who took up Lenin's baton and he was a lifelong defender of what he felt Lenin had tried to establish, there's a nice quote where he um, basically outlines the kind of parties that we need to build, not in terms of organisational uh, niceties, but you know our attitude to the working class, the masses and their struggle. He said, an intellectual pseudo-aristocratic squeamish attitude toward the people was foreign to Bolshevism, hostile to its very nature. The Bolsheviks were not lily-handed friends of the masses, not pedants. They were not afraid of those backward strata, now for the first time lifting themselves out of the dregs. The Bolsheviks took the people as preceding history had created them and as they were called to achieve the revolution. The Bolsheviks saw it as their mission to stand at the head of the people. I think that gives us an idea of what perhaps a lot of us are trying to do. So I'll leave it there. Muchas gracias, Sandra. Thank you very much, Sandra. Bueno, queríamos avisarles antes de pasar al siguiente. Well, we would like to tell you before we, we go on to the next speaker you know that in just a few days we're going to publish in our web website of the ISL very interesting articles in of Sandra about Lenin. The so website, all of you should be aware of that and read them as soon as possible. And to continue, to we're going to ask Comrade Imran to turn on his mic. Imran Kamyana from yeah. the leadership of the struggle, Pakistan. Imran. Uh, thank you, complete. I hope yeah. I'm audible. Gracias, Imran. Si estás listo, inicia. Imran, if you're ready, you can begin. Yeah. Uh, Am I audible? Can you listen to me? Sí, perfecto. Yes, perfectly. Okay. So, first of all, uh, comrades, uh, it's uh, really good uh, that uh, we are uh, discussing uh, Lenin and his legacy and his ideas uh, after about uh, like 100 years uh, since his uh, death and a lot of people are attending uh, this uh, seminar in person and online. Uh, so it has been more than a uh, hundred years uh, since Lenin died on uh, January uh, 21st, 1924. Like Marx, uh, he is among uh, the people most vilified and demonized by the ruling class classes throughout the history. He has been portrayed as a bloodthirsty tyrant and power-hungry dictator, not only by the conservatives, but also the liberals. While most left reformists, along with repeating these bourgeois slanders, also depict him as an impatient adventurist who somehow sabotaged uh, the process of Russian revolution by leading his party to pow power in October 1917. In this regard, the Bolshevik Revolution is often portrayed as a, as a coup made by Lenin's party instead of a popular uprising in which workers and soldiers took power, which, uh, which it actually was. Even if they acknowledge uh, the popular content in October uh, insurrection, it is still deemed as premature. It is also declared that uh, uh, these were Lenin's policies, which ultimately paved the way for Stalinism. 
So these are the allegations made on Lenin by the reformists and the, and the bourgeois liberals. But uh, then there is another extreme to which Stalinism tends to take things. Stalinists raise Lenin to the to the status of a saint or a prophet, an omnipotent, all-knowing figure who had uh, the blueprint of the revolution in his mind from the very beginning, uh, and uh, who could make uh, who could make no mistakes. In this uh, vulgar version of uh, version of history, the Bolshevik Party uninterruptedly moved towards the state power under the undisputed leadership of Lenin. Ironically, in uh, in actual uh, ironically in actual political work and policy, these same people, these Stalinists, stand for everything which contradicts Lenin and betrays the leg legacy of Bolshevik Revolution to the core. It is a duty of Marxists to defend Lenin against these two vulgar or bigoted approaches, for which it becomes necessary to understand him first. Lenin, in the final analysis, like every other human being, was a product of his times. But he was not an ordinary product. He was one of those few extraordinary people who are not only able to grasp the objective process of history, but also able to give a logical and conscious expression to this unconscious historical uh, development, hence altering its very course. In this respect, he, along with Trotsky, built upon the basis laid by Marx and Engels. For this, he first of all had to defend the legacy of Marxism against the ideal, ideological onslaughts of bourgeoisie and intrigue of social democratic reformism. Throughout his life, particularly during the short terms of events, he ha had to illuminate and bring out the essence of Marxism from loads and loads of dust thrown upon it by the left and right reformism. Throughout his life, he continuously uh, fought against the tendencies of turning Marxism into a dogma or making it a benign or harmless ideology, a kind of mysticism by taking the class struggle out of it. His immense contributions to Marxism span for spheres, uh, from spheres of political economy to philosophy, from history to the art of party building, and from his very prolific work on national question to the problems facing a socialist revolution in a backward country like Russia. We should have no doubt that his overall approach, analysis, and conclusions remain very much valid and relevant to this day. Here, I would like uh, to uh, very concisely highlight the essence of Lenin's works in the, uh, in the aforementioned fields. Let's uh, first of all take the question of party. One of the Lenin's uh, foremost contributions to the cause of uh, historical emancipation of proletariat has been that he, taking lessons from Marx and Engels, pioneered the science of a vanguard vanguard or revolutionary party. You can also call it the art of like making and building the party. Party for him was a fundamental tool of proletariat without which social socialist revolution was inconceivable. In his, uh, in his article, What is to be done and later on many others, Lenin articulated his idea of a revolutionary party, emphasizing the necessity of a highly organized, unified organization made up of professional revolutionaries. In order to organize the proletariat in carrying out a victorious socialist revolution, Lenin emphasized the signific significance of a strong organizational structure, intellectual coherence, and centralized leadership. For this, he proposed uh, democratic centralism as a basic fundamental or vital political mechanism within the party, which he defined as universal and full freedom to debate and criticize, but a complete unity of action when a decision has been made or when a decision has been reached. There should be no doubt that despite all internal contradiction, weaknesses, or confusions, it was only through such an organization and discipline that Bolshevik party was able to uh, give a logical conclusion to Russian Revolution by taking power in October 1917. And in spite of modification in tactics, organizational structures, and or uh, strategy owing to different objective conditions, the prime mechanism of a victorious uh, proletarian revolution remains the same to this day. Similarly, Lenin had to wage a ruthless war against victorious, uh, uh, against various currents of idealism which in our times mostly present themselves as totally reactionary and absurd ideology of postmodernism. 
like Marx, philosophy for Lenin was not merely an activity of intellectual debates and discussion, but a weapon of class struggle. While vigorously defending dialectical materialism against imperial criticism of his time, Lenin not only acknowledged the existen existence of an objective material world, but highlighted the importance of understanding the objective reality as a constantly changing interconnecting, uh, interconnected process. He contended that by downplaying the actual truth of the outside world, empiricism, uh, uh, Critical uh, the, the uh, imperial criticism, uh, critical notions breed a skepticism and agnosticism that weakens the working class capacity for revolution. Moreover, he argued that sensations alone uh, alone cannot provide a complete understanding of the world. Rather, reflection and abstractions are necessary for comprehensive uh, and scientific worldview. Hence, Lenin basically argued that objective world not only exists. Not only it can be understood and uh, uh, it, it can be understood and apprehended, but it can also uh, but it can it can also be changed. Materialism and imperial criticism reflects Lenin's commitment to defend and develop the philosophical foundations of Marxism in the face of challenging uh, challenges from reactionary philosophical currents. The work uh, remains uh, an important text in the history of Marxist philosophy and the tradition of revolutionary materialist thought. Likewise, Lenin made invaluable contributions to the Marxist theory of imperialism. Analyzing the political economy of global capitalism of his era, he highlighted the fact that uh, capitalism had, uh, had evolved a lot since Marx's times and entered its highest stage. Hence, while Marx critically analyzed uh, the capitalism at a time when it had not much outgrown the boundaries of nation states and market competition was still uh, prevalent, to some extent, Lenin made an analysis of capitalism in its monopoly stage and built a theory of uh, imperialism on scientific grounds. It doesn't mean at all that uh, the analysis by Marx uh, has been rendered obsolete, but Lenin essentially developed his analysis of capitalism from the, uh, from the point Marx and Engels had left it, and hence complemented uh, their work. However, it is the responsibility of Marxists today to develop Lenin's work on imperialism further as particularly after the Second World War, global capitalism has undergone many profound changes and exploitative mechanisms of imperialism have also evolved or transformed a lot accordingly. Nevertheless, the basic tenets of Lenin's analysis of imperialism remain valid even after 100 years. Uh, then uh, I would like to uh, highlight uh, Lenin's thought on the national question as today, a vast majority of global population still resides in colonial or, or formerly colonial countries with related capitalism, having deep, deep imprints of uneven and combined development, uh, having deep imprints of uneven and combined pattern of development on their societies. Among many other peculiar problems emerging from this pattern of belated capitalist development, national question also remains mostly unresolved in these countries. Uh, many of which are societies with numerous nationalities, like they have uh, uh, a lot of nationalities uh, live within the boundary of a nation state, as we see in Pakistan or India or, or in many other countries in Latin America or uh, Africa. Here, once again, Lenin's pro prolific work on national question requires utmost importance and relevance for a viable revolutionary strategy and program. A translational program which is unable to sufficiently address the national question in, in these countries would not only be incomplete, but generally in, irrelevant. In the Marxist movement of his times, there were elements which were unwilling to admit the importance or even the very existence of national question, like uh, we see in the, in the thought of uh, Comrade Rosa Luxembourg. Then there were people on the other extreme who, tend, who tended to subordinate the class struggle to the struggle of national emancipation. Lenin had to wage an extensive fight against both, both of these tendencies. He vehemently fought for the inclusion of the right of self-determination for oppressed nations in the party program. But at the very same time, he clarified that Marxists don't advocate the separation and formation of small states on national basis. Similarly, he always subordinated the national question to the wider struggle for socialist transformation of the society. This uh, position on national question played a vital role in the victory of Bolsheviks by winning the 
distrust of exploit uh, of exploited uh, exploited mass masses of oppressed nations of Tsarist Russia, and in Trotsky's word words helping pour uh, the national indignation into the channel of Bolshevism. Trotsky has also uh, called the national policy of Lenin among, uh, among the eternal treasures of mankind. Another invaluable contrib contribution of Lenin to revolutionary strategy has been that he not only insisted, but also advised the party, uh, 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 but also devised the policy of intervening and working in reformist organization and, uh, organizations and institutions, whether it be mass social democratic parties, trade unions, or elections. Here, once again, he had to fight against the ultra leftist crunch, which he rightly denoted as suffering from an infantile disorder. The prime motive for working in mass reformist organizations for Lenin was to win over the workers uh, present there through the struggle for pro proletarian reforms and also. Uh, exposing the reformist leadership and limitations of reformism in the same process, in the same struggle. Uh, this policy was later refined and adapted by various uh, Trotsky's groups according to given circumstances in the strategy called entryism, and in many cases proved to be quite fruitful. Although the cases of its overuse or even abuse for uh, opportunistic reasons are also numerous. However, as long as capitalism exists, reformist organization would not only remain, but at times would be able to gain mass influence. As a result, Lenin, uh, uh, fight against, Lenin's fight against sectarianism and his guidelines for connecting, connecting with the masses involved in the reformist processes and winning them over to revolutionary program would also remain important and relevant. Finally, I would like uh, uh, to uh, come uh, to an aspect of uh, Lenin's legacy which remains most, mostly obscure and unexplored even to this day. Unfortunately, not only Stalinism, but also Trotsky's tendencies in general have either suppressed or shunned this discussion. It's Lenin's discussion on the economics of transition, which he initiated in the last part of his life and which ultimately culminated first in the conception of state capitalism and later in, the, uh, in, in, his, in his policy of new uh, economic policy. This policy, uh, this new economic policy, in which elements of market were given concessions in the conditions of extreme backwardness, devastation, and isolation of Russian Revolution, also shows uh, uh, while uh, that uh, while Lenin was absolutely determined, resolute, and uncom un uncompromising in preserving the revolutionary essence of Marxism, he was very flexible when it came to tactics. He even didn't hesitate to make compromises when necessary. But such compromises used to be tactical, not uh, not ideological. And through them, he used to buy time to strike back, strike back at an appropriate time. Abandonment of uh, the policy of war communism and total nationalization in favor of a uh, new economic policy was one of such tactical compromises and uh, necessary but temporary retreat, retreats through which Lenin wanted to buy time and hold on until the victorious revolution in Europe particularly in Germany. But NEP uh, or the new economic policy contains valuable lessons even today, particularly for the revolutions of underdeveloped countries like Pakistan. As highlighted by Lenin again and again, the crux of countries, uh, the crux of the problem is that as long as the socialist revolution remains trapped and isolated in a backward country, it will have to make compromises not only with the national but also the international capital which under uh, certain circumstances can result in the undoing of the very revolution. Additionally, the more underdeveloped a country is, the more painful, complicated, lengthy, and uncertain would be its transition away from capitalism, until and unless capitalism is uprooted in its imperialist centers and proletariat of advanced countries come to the aid of its class brethren in the backward regions of the world. This is one of the reasons Lenin remained an uncompromising internationalist all his life and saw Russian Revolution just one battle in the historic war for international revolution and global socialism. Another proof of uh, why Lenin was, was not and still isn't uh, uh, like uh, an, another proof of why Leninism was not and still isn't a ready made recipe of revolution is change in Lenin's conception of revolution in Russia after February 1917 
when taking lessons from uh, events and circumstances, he broke away with his prior policy of revolutionary uh, democratic dictatorship of proletariat and peasantry in April, in April thesis. And uh, uh, he basically uh, abandoned uh, this, uh, his prior conception of revolution in, in favor of Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution. However, even when he upheld the former, uh, former conception of revolution, he always uh, fervently battled the tendencies of class collaboration, uh, reformism, and gradualism, including economism, and wanted to give stimulus to the socialist revolution in advanced Europe by the overthrow of autocracy in Russia through a democratic revolution. But then Trotsky himself was mistaken on the character and internal mechanism of the party for quite some time and ultimately reconciled with Lenin in 1917 after the February Re Revolution. The two leaders of the Bolshevik, uh, uh, Bolshevik party hence complemented each other, uh, complemented each other. While it is true that without a victorious socialist revolution in Russia, not many people today would, would have known Lenin and Trotsky, it is also equally true that without them, the revolution in Russia would have would, uh, would not have been victorious. Here, it is also worth mentioning that uh, after returning uh, to Russia after uh, February Revolution, Lenin had to wage a ruthless ideological struggle even within the party in order to prepare it uh, for taking over the state power. And for in, in this regard, he wrote State and Revolution, in which he, he argued uh, that uh, a bourgeois state cannot be reformed and cannot be used uh, for the workers' uh, power, and it will have, uh, and we will have to smash the uh, 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 the bourgeois state completely and create a new state with new uh, institutions uh, for the workers' uh, power and for the workers' rule. Um, at last, in the uh, last part, like I would like to highlight Lenin's last fight uh, against the degeneration of revolution and emerging Stalinism. And he was totally aware of the problems of uh, Russian Revolution. Uh, and uh, he was aware that a, 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 a new bureaucratic uh, a clique or a caste was uh, taking hold of the workers, uh, newly bought worker state. Throughout his uh, final years, he issued warnings in this regard and tried to resist the rise of bureaucracy in the newly bought worker state. But his early death was a tragedy having historic consequences. After Lenin, the left opposition led by Trotsky waged a selfless and glorious struggle against Stalinism, but was ultimately crushed. And it was on the grave of Lenin's original party uh, that st Stalinism triumphed, as most of the vanguard Bolsheviks had been killed by late 1930s. But contrary to the malicious bourgeois propaganda, Stalinism wasn't, was not the ultimate uh, outcome of Leninism, but everything contrary to it. In the final analysis, it was the result of isolation of the revolution in a very poor and technically and culturally backward country uh, uh, that Stalinism emerged. Stal but it is the Stalinism is mostly that after the collapse of Soviet Union in 1991. Yet the ideas of Lenin are very much alive and relevant even after 100 years. They continue to shine like a lighthouse in the era of darkness and decay and guide revolutionary socialists all over the world in the historic struggle for the overthrow of a rotten and obsolete social system called capitalism. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Imran. Thank you very much, Imran. To continue, uh, we will give the floor to our comrade Alejandro coordinator of the Gracias. International Socialist League. Como diría Pichetto, no aplaudan. <laughs> Pichetto would say, don't. It's been a hundred years since uh, Lenin left us. It's important to remember him remember his lessons because though 100 years have passed, Marxism is not a dogma. It's not a recipe that you can just apply just reading books because situations are 
often very different, but the general lines and lessons of Leninism in general terms are still very current. That's why it's important to read, to study Lenin, because you learn new things. Without Lenin, a, the October Revolution would not have taken place. The first victorious socialist revolution had a leadership. The entire Bolshevik leadership, except Lenin, was discussing how not to carry out the revolution. So Lenin's role was fundamental. Like Imran was saying, Trotsky was mistaken on a fundamental question. Trotsky did not comprehend the necessity of a revolutionary party and questioned Lenin on this. But Trotsky himself, through the process of the revolution, vindicated Lenin on this question and assumed his previous mistake and argued that without Lenin's lines and without that organization, the revolution would not have been possible. That unity, Trotsky, of course, uh, contributed his theory of permanent revolution. But as we have said, Lenin, without Trotsky, could have reached similar positions. His um, April thesis came close to this. But without the Bolshevik party, which was built by Lenin, the revolution would not have taken place. That is the importance. Yeah. He didn't only contribute with the theory of the party. He recovered a Marx that had been adulterated by the leaders of social democracy at the time, especially since 1914, when they caved into the imperialist war. And those who had been the continuation of Marxism at that time fell into a profound degeneration that they had even attempted to hide behind Marx and Engels, ideas that have nothing to do with them. Lenin recovers the authentic Marx. One a text I, I often recommend comrades who join the party, there's many of Lenin that are important, but State and Revolution, for example, or his imperialism, April thesis. I'm going to refer to some essential concepts. Now, Lenin and Marxism was never a dogma. Lenin was never dogmatic. That's why they led the struggle to take power in Russia, a backwards country that according to the Marxism of the time, that was not possible. The most orthodox Marxists of that time were possibly the Mensheviks, who argued that this was not a time in which you could have a revolution in Russia. Only in advanced countries could that happen. The theorists of the time argued it could only happen in advanced countries like Germany and not in a backward country like Russia. And Lenin which coincided with Trotsky on this point, against the grain of the Orthodox Marxism of the time, argued that a backwards country like Russia, which was a weak link, could advance 
And because they gave themselves that task, they were able to lead a victorious revolution. If they had been dogmatic with the main ideas of the time, without analyzing reality, the relation of forces, without seeing that uh, since 1914, capitalism had entered a regressive stage with the uh, advance of imperialism, the world war were not the same as the previous stage. And so revolutions in poor countries could advance. Now, if they had had a dogmatic perspective, they would not have advanced them there. The Mensheviks at the time were arguing with dogma and saying that the Bolsheviks were wanting to do something that was not possible, that we had to wait and allow bourgeois democracy to develop in the country. Bolsheviks, that could, which could have been true decades past, was no longer the case. Is to answer criticisms that a Leninism or Marxism is dogmatic when it's exactly the opposite. If something needs to be changed, you have to change. Because if a revolutionary is not capable of changing themselves, you are no longer revolutionary. There are some fundamental ideas of Lenin for today. Lenin wrote between February and October a text that is very important today that I recommend, which is State and Revolution. The state is a debate today, given some of right wing expression. Some of the question the state and that it needs to be smaller. Back then, there was a debate in German social democracy with a sector that argued that instead of destroying the state, we had to take it over. And so we can reach power without destroying the bourgeois state. German social democracy had developed so much. It was such a big party with big parliamentary presence. And so they had begun to adapt to the rhythms of bourgeois democracy. And so instead of destroying the state, we can reach socialism through the electoral road and a Pacific peaceful road. So between February and October, Lenin writes against what the Mensheviks that were arguing something similar. Lenin wrote that that was doomed to failure, that there's no possibility of advancing without destroying the bourgeois state. It's the only way for the society to advance. And this is still a very important debate today because there are many people today who position themselves on the left, the center left, who say that the revolution is not on the table today. It's not, there's no possibility. And so what we can do is to improve the state, to reform the state. There was a tragic example of this in Chile where there was the conditions were there to destroy the state, but Allende, his leadership, argued that they had to maintain the state, that it was through the current state that they could consolidate or build socialism. 
the Chilean masses paid for this with over 10,000 deaths of the class vanguard of the time. Lenin recovers Marx on the issue of the state is great because not only recovered Marx's theory of the state, but he carried out he carried it out in practice, he destroyed the bourgeois state in Russia and defined with more precision what is the bourgeois state, which has two main characteristics. One is that the state, as we know it today, even in the various stages of domination, but through all of them, the state is the dictatorship of one class over another. So the bourgeois state, whether it has a more dictatorial or more democratic regime, there is a minority that has the armed forces as a fundamental pillar to control and defend the private property of that minority. Composed of a few thousand or a few million in the world of privileged rich that defend that defend that state. It's uh, the privileged caste of officials, parliamentarians, will defend that state because it's through that state that they maintain their privileges. That's why Lenin but argued that there was no possibility of advancing without destroying all that. And he took the example of the Paris Commune because though it was the first workers' revolution that was able to advance, was unable to finish destroying that state. He argued that the first measures that a worker's state had to take up is to destroy the army and destroy that caste of village officials. That measure that no one can win more than a worker. So to destroy that bureaucratic apparatus is fundamental to destroy all those privileges that senators, parliamentarians, that everyone earned the same as a worker. Now, this path of destroying the armed forces and to destroy the privileges of that caste of thousands, hundreds of thousands who live with those privileges cannot be a peaceful struggle because neither the armed forces nor that caste of privileged people will give up their situation without a struggle. So the struggle for socialism, if it's not a full-fledged struggle to the last drop of blood, we will never be able to have full control of the productive forces without destroying those who will resist that. Now, these were important debates without a practical example that would give one or another the, the right. This and Lenin's second great 
contribution, which is the party, because while one debate is whether to destroy the state or not, the other one was what kind of party do we need? Do we need a party strong enough to destroy the state or do we need a party that because it is not possible or necessary to destroy the state, we need a party that is more relaxed? Lenin argued that because the task was to destroy the state, we didn't need a relaxed party. We needed a party that had as its strategy the destruction of the state. And for that, it needed to be a party of professional revolution with a hard nucleus that could sustain activity not only with democratic rights, but also to sustain the activity when the bourgeoisie implements democracy in dictatorship, like the bourgeoisie periodically does. That's why the bourgeoisie, when democracy fails them, they are quick to implement the dictatorship for authoritarian regime. By the form of the bourgeois state can change and vary, but the essential element that it is a dictatorship of a minority is always there. So it was necessary not only to drive the mobilization, the struggle of the masses, but to build a party that would not dissolve when democratic rights are taken away, as would happen with many social democratic organizations when the bourgeoisie applied repression. It's an important debate between Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg on this. Rosa Luxemburg, who was a tremendous revolutionary of her time, she didn't have the same concept of the party as Lenin, more similar to what Trotsky thought at the time, that a very centralized party was mistaken. And she paid for that mistake with her life. Because in Germany, when the reaction came, because she didn't have a party that could protect its leaders from a repression, it didn't have that capacity and centralization. A whole layer of revolutionaries was assassinated during the process of the revolution itself. So Lenin's contribution on what kind of party we need. These are debates that are important today. In the United States, these are current that developed in the crisis of capitalism, which is the DSA, that operates within the Democratic Party. That says that we need to recover Kauki against Lenin because the revolution is no longer possible because democracy convinces the masses so much. So more than a party to fight for power, we need to build a party to have electoral strength and generate changes from there. So these theories reappear permanently. In many of our countries, we have friends that because of the rise of the right, revolutionary parties are the past. We need to uh, reunite with broader reformist sectors to stop the right. 
Unfortunately, there's a lot of contribution of Lenin's that because of the stage of development of capitalism, if we don't destroy, if we don't defeat capitalism, we will not be able to advance in reform. Rather, capitalism will take us further and further towards barbarism. Even democracy is more and more in danger because capitalism in crisis needs more and more authoritarian measures. And that is where Lenin's lessons are reformed. There's no possibility of advancing without defeating capitalism. And to defeat capitalism is to defeat the capitalist state. And to defeat defeating the capitalist state means defeating those who defend the capitalist state, which are the repressive forces. It means to destroy the state, to destroy that caste of privileged people. And this can only happen in a revolution. If Lenin had been naive and not prepared for this, revolutions happen. But if we don't have a tool to lead that process, revolutions lose, fail. And many of them end in a process of counter revolution because the bourgeoisie in desperation when a revolution fails so towards the vanguard of the world today we see a polarization in the world there's a poll that has more political expressions. This happens when capitalism has more crisis. And that political, is, that political expression is more and more right wing. In the whole world, on one of those polls, there's a political expression which is increasingly counter revolutionary. Now, there is another poll the world situation, which is the pole of the class struggle, which is also developing more and more. We've seen it in Argentina today, people that react against the pole of the right, but that does not have yet a political expression. So the pole of the class struggle develops more and more, but does not have a political expression. The tasks that are posed today is to build that political expression in the struggles. And it is a debate that we need to build. I think in this sense, Leninism, not as a dogma, not as a recipe, but as a guide to action, continues to be the only theory that is current. We don't build an organization that does not just do propaganda, but inserts itself in the working class and struggles, and at the same time, a revolutionary tool to fight for power, this situation can fail and lose. And the other pole of the political right can end up striking us hard and advancing. So discussion on Lenin is not a historical debate. It's a current debate. Lenin died in a tragic moment because he died very few years into the revolutionary process. And Russia, because of a series of objective conditions, but also because it lost its main leader, it went into a fast bureaucratization. And it's another debate we need today. But Trotsky took up that struggle, but he was defeated. That's why Stalinism was consolidated in Russia and in the world. 
many people because of the influence of colonism had. Many people associate all of the ideas of revolutionary Marxism and of Lenin, even of Trotskyism, to Stalinism. And so have a very distorted vision of what Marxism is. And that is why sometimes it's difficult to explain that we have nothing to do with everything that happened in that political uh, period with, we have nothing to do with the outcome of that, with how that ended, with Nicaragua, with Venezuela, that real socialism has nothing to do with that. In State and Revolution, that's why I recommend reading it, Recovering Marx, what Lenin argues is that taking power, which is a fundamental question in order to change society, he argues that for a period, we will need a state precisely to confront the reaction of the bourgeoisie. In the case of Russia, there was 14 armies the world bourgeoisie united to fight against the revolution. And so it was necessary to build a state with a army to fight to defend that. But in the bottom line, Marxists don't believe that our end objective is to build a state. We think it needs to be a brief period, that it is necessary for that moment, but that in itself creates pressures and tendencies towards privatization and elements that turn against the masses. So from the first moment of taking power, the process of destroying the new state we build needs to begin to advance towards a future in which there will be no state, because that is our objective. But that is why the revolution has to be international. It is impossible to advance in this sense in one country. This is something Trotsky had to develop more and more, and that is why we are fan fanatics of the world revolution because there's no possibility of destroying the state, even destroying the transitional state that we will be obliged to build to resist the bourgeois reaction. It will be impossible to destroy all that without the revolution being international. The tragedy of the Russian revolution is that the German revolution was defeated because that was and the lesson there is that there wasn't a Bolshevik party in Germany. That's that had to be transitional, ended up strengthening and taking it on its own dynamic and destroying the revolution from within. So it's important to debate Lenin because in the last part of his life, seeing that there was a process of bureaucratization, put up a tremendous struggle against that, that is even reflected in his testament. That it was necessary to begin to fight against that bureaucracy because that state that had to be built, as Marx, Lenin, Trotsky had said, was beginning to transform into something else with another new layer of a privileged caste, and that they ended up destroying the revolution from within, which unfortunately is what ended up. That's why Lenin's lessons are fundamental for the tasks we have before us, for the debates 
that we have in the vanguard for the debates we have with those who argue that we need to fight only for reforms with those who think they can change things in a peaceful way but the violence does not begin with the people and the workers that want to change things it begins with the minority the ruling minority that knows that the only way to remain in power is to build a humongous apparatus of repressive forces and we'll use it against workers every time we run. So if we need to, if we want to change the world before they lead us to barbarism, we need to prepare ourselves and prepare the tools so they don't defeat us when the masses rise and to have the tools to defeat them. And many of those tools have an important base in what Lenin and the Bolsheviks were able to carry out and the lessons they drew from that. The state and revolution, imperialism, the, what is to be done, the April thesis, are, these are all fundamental um, works of Marxism that reading that without dogmatism are a powerful tool for what we need to do. I think the best homage to Lenin in 100 years since his death is to, yeah, have these talks, but fundamentally to build the fundamental tool we need to defeat the, the bourgeoisie, discuss what kind of party we need, a party that is not only for elections, because we're not sectarian ultra leftist, but we are also not opportunist. We don't believe that elections is the way for revolution. It's the class struggle that can change society. The class struggle that can change society is the socialist revolution. And for that, it is necessary to build revolutionary parties in every country and a revolutionary international. The capitalism will carry us to barbarism or a third world war in a brief period, possibly, because they are capable of taking us to a new conflagration of those characteristics in their struggle. They're destroying the planet. The extreme right that is on the right, on the right. Retreat years in the past in democratic rights. But we need to win over working masses to there's a struggle against all that, but we need to build the organization that can be capable of that. And we think it's going to be on the table. We're, we're not pessimistic. Humanity will not be dragged into barbarism without resisting, without doing revolutions and rebellions. Now, what they can't do on their own is to build a revolutionary alternative. The most conscious sectors have the task. And all these talks and activities we do are uh, at the service of this strategic task. Bueno, muchas gracias, Alejandro. Lo que proponemos, Alejandro, what we propose next is to open space for questions, for interventions, uh, short uh, space because of our time so that we can take advantage of this situation. And we have Sandra here, Alejandro and Imran before Imran goes to sleep. 
Here we have one comrade to make a question or an intervention or contribution. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I wanted, Alejandro, if you could talk about how is it that we, with workers, defend the state against anarchist capitalist um, attacks at the same time that we say that we want to destroy it. So if we could talk a little bit about that. I would really appreciate it. Any other question or intervention in the chat, on YouTube, on Facebook, or in Socialist Revolution as well, in Portuguese, you can make any question. And we can read them. Anyone else? Uh -huh. ¿Alguna pregunta o alguna intervención? Ahí estamos esperando. Any other question or contribution? Por el chat, si no, you can send them through the okay. chat. I would like to know, I'm finishing reforms or revolutions from Rosa Luxemburgo, and I wanted to know which elements or which factors or what do you think regarding the, the failure of German revolution? One more question. Hello. I would like to know. Can you hear me? Okay. The, um, I would like to know about the development of socialism in this country. If we could do it only here, how would that turn out? Being uh, only one socialist country in Latin America. Another question? Two more questions. I just had a question. We talked about two poles or two, two different sectors. Are we on a revolutionary stage? Is there a revolutionary front? As we talked about two sides. Are we on a global revolutionary situation? I would like that to, to be further explained. And there's another question right here, or contribution as well. Taking into account Lenin's elaboration on imperialism as a face of capitalism, when we talked about sub-developed countries or underdeveloped countries or colonized countries, right now, which would be the right uh, orientation with these uh, imperialist powers? or emergent powers, as the ones in BRICS, which would be the orientation of popular fronts or social democratic fronts or nationalist fronts, which talk about independence from uh, traditional um, imperialism, like the United States, or those who sport, export capital. I have two questions from the chat, and then we can 
go to the closing of, of each comrade. One of them is, we talked about agenda's process in Chile. Could Pinochet could be avoided. And which are the keys to build a revolutionary party as the one that was built by Lenin? Bien. Bueno, con estas preguntas e intervenciones pasaríamos a los minutos. Going to the um, closing statements after these um, questions. So, Sandra, if you're there, if you can hear us, I would like, uh, just as we did during the opening, you would speak first, then Imram, then Alejandra, if you would like that. Sandra, are you there? Can you hear us? <clears throat> Perfect. Sorry, I I've never got the translation. Um, but I, I listened to some of it on Facebook. I could say something about the German revolution. It's the only question I understood. Okay, Sandra. I'm very sorry. I I couldn't. I just haven't been able to get the translation. I but someone told me to watch it on Facebook, so I watched it on as much of it I could on Facebook on my iPad. <laughs> so I heard that there was a question about the German Revolution. So I'll just say something so that I can be a bit, little bit part of the discussion. Um, <clears throat> My my explanation for the German Revolution's failure was that Rosa Luxemburg um, didn't, like you couldn't argue that Rosa Luxemburg should have been outside the Social Democratic Party. It was a mass party. But I do think if Lenin had been in that situation, he would have bought, built a faction inside the party. But when the uh, party supported the war, Luxemburg and the people around her had very they didn't really have any sort of organisation that they could mobilise. And so they eventually they formed the Communist Party, but it's too late. And Luxembourg hesitated, didn't really want to form the Communist Party, even when they did. And so I think all the um, marvellous contribution that people like Luxembourg and, um, well, Leibniz was um, indisciplined anyway, but they didn't have the experience of actually organising as a disciplined group that carried out the things that they decided to. And, you know, I just think they were in disarray. And then Luxembourg and Liebknecht being murdered made the situation worse. And um, I think the Communist Party made um, a lot of marvellous efforts to try to learn how to build a united front and how to lead. And they succeeded in some places and not others. But by October 1923, the um, Social Democrats had managed to corrupt the workers' councils and um, really the revolution was um, not able to succeed. So I think it's one of the huge tragedies of the 20th cent century because if they had been able to um, begin to build a workers' state, it would have changed the whole world history because Stalin possibly would not have been able to... Um, uh, developed the bureaucracy that he did because they would have got support from the worker state in Germany. But um, And I, I was just going to say that I agreed with most of what Imran said, but um, I just couldn't understand um, Alejandro. I'm sorry. So if next time we do it, someone will have to make sure I can use the technology properly. So solidarity with everyone. It's wonderful to see what's happening in Argentina. I hope you can keep the struggle going. Bueno, 
Pasamos al cierre de Imram. Imram. Okay, we will hear Imran's closing statements now. Uh, thank you, comrades. Uh, a lot uh, has already been uh, said about the life and struggle and the ideas of Lenin. Uh, comrade uh, Sandra uh, discussed a lot of uh, aspects uh, of uh, party building uh, by Lenin and the Russian Revolution and the role of the uh, uh, Bolshevik party and the Lenin's idea ideas on, on the state as uh, depicted in his uh, uh, very important work, the State and Revolution. And then uh, Comrade Ali has also highlighted uh, the discussions within the Bolshevik party and uh, uh, on the revolution, uh, the, the role of uh, uh, the party for the revolution and uh, what to do with the bourgeois state. I would uh, just say that uh, capitalism uh, after 2008 is uh, once again uh, in a very deep uh, crisis. It's a historic crisis of uh, capitalism, particularly uh, in, the, in, in the advanced world. The growth rates are uh, falling or even uh, when there is growth, it is a very joyless and jobless uh, growth and uh, we see unemployment, falling standards of living and attacks on the working class and uh, snatching away of all those privileges which, which the working class won in after uh, uh, Second World War, including uh, free education, uh, free health care and uh, dismantling of uh, uh, so-called welfare state which capitalism built uh, in the so-called golden era of uh, post-war boom. So uh, one of the expressions of this crisis of capitalism is uh, the, rise of, uh, the rise of far right all over the world. Uh, comrades uh, 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 in Argentina uh, are experiencing, are like uh, facing this uh, uh, far right uh, uh, president and, and his government and his, uh, his attacks on on the working people. Same is uh, the case in many of the countries of uh, Europe, including Germany, Holland, uh, and uh, France, where the far right is uh, all, either already in, in the power or it, uh, it is coming closer uh, uh, to, to, to taking power or sharing it with the so-called uh, 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 soft uh, right or, 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 the, or, or, or the liberals. So these are very uh, critical uh, times. But on the other hand, we see uh, movements starting particularly from 2011. We saw it in Greece. Then there was uh, an uprising of the Arab uh, Supreme. And then there was this second episode of Arab Supreme a few years ago. So there is a resistance by the working people all over the world. But still, uh, like it's uh, not... Uh, and, and like uh, this uh, energy and this resistance and uh, this agitation of working class is not being channeled into uh, the revolutionary uh, program and, uh, and the, uh, like they are unable to find a revolutionary way out of, uh, of this crisis. So uh, it's, it, has, it, it is uh, also to do with the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and this propaganda that socialism has failed and uh, then how Stalinism basically uh, uh, defamed uh, the name of Marxism and socialism and Leninism. But uh, in the days to come, we'll be seeing uh, many more uprisings, rebellions, protests, movements all over the all over the world. And in this regard, Lenin and his ideas and the uh, legacy of Bolshevik Revolution is still very much relevant uh, for for us. This is like a, a the historic lesson of uh, the last three or 400 years that capitalism cannot uh, be reformed. Uh, neither can it be transformed into socialism through a gradual or democratic process as was the illusion of uh, social democracy in, in, in Lenin's times. It has to be smashed. 
and without a revolutionary party, without a vanguard, without a Bolshevik party, you cannot smash capitalism, you cannot overthrow it. There is no other way of doing a uh, revolution even after 100 years uh, uh, of uh, uh, after Lenin. So uh, we have to build the revolutionary parties, revolutionary international, taking lessons from, from the Bolsheviks, from Lenin, from Trotsky, and also uh, understanding and uh, uh, discussing uh, the mistakes with, uh, which they made, their weaknesses, their problems, their confusions, but still uh, the legacy of Lenin, his ideas uh, are very much alive, very much relevant, and uh, we have to build on those ideas. As I mentioned, there is a lot of work uh, which needs to be done uh, uh, in the development of, uh, further development of Marxism particularly on uh, the transitional economics, which we must discuss these things, uh, the new economic policy, what Lenin wanted through this policy, what uh, he was uh, uh, planning and how he was uh, uh, trying to hold on uh, while there, is, there are revolutions in Europe. These are very important uh, debates uh, and very much re relevant even to this day. And then we must also like uh, further uh, develop the, uh, the theory of uh, uh, Marxist theory of uh, imperialism according to our times, because after the Second World War, there have been a lot of changes in the global economy and the overall political and economic situation of the world, as uh, some Marxists uh, have called the present stage of capitalism as, as, as late capitalism. It is very different from the capitalism of Lenin's time, although the analysis uh, of uh, Marx and Lenin are relevant uh, to this day, but still we need to understand what uh, changes uh, have uh, have been uh, uh, have have taken place uh, in the in the workings of global capitalism, its economy, and how the imperialism has adopted many new methods of uh, exploitation and oppression all over the world. So uh, I would uh, close here that uh, solidarity for all the comrades uh, in Argentina who are fighting uh, this anti-people, anti-working class uh, government of uh, Chile. And uh, we have uh, to organize the working people. We have to build the revolutionary party. We have to overthrow capitalism, not only in one country, not only in a continent, but all over the world. Because it's a global system, it needs to be fought globally and uh, on the nationalist basis as, um, as uh, uh, highlighted and devised by Lenin and Trotsky. And uh, in this crisis, uh, then there is a, a climate crisis, this catastrophe, which is like destroying the ecosystems and environment of the world. And in this regard, if you if you uh, add all these things, these wars, these imperialist interventions, uh, civil wars, the climate uh, uh, climate uh, change, uh, the rise of the far right, and uh, other uh, consequences of the crisis of capitalism, we have no doubt uh, to say that uh, humanity only has two paths, uh, two ways in front of it. One is socialism, and one is barbarism, and only through uh, a socialist revolution can uh, this uh, barbarism, uh, humanity can avoid uh, uh, this, uh, uh, these, uh, these signs of barbarism and, uh, and build a, a really, actually a human society in which uh, the oppression of man on man comes to an end. Thank you. Gracias, Imran. Thank you, Imran. Now we will hear Alejandro's closing statements. Uh, first place, uh, thank you, Sandra, who made a great effort. We have 14 hours of difference, but even more so from Central America, which has 17 hours of difference. Some comrades are listening one day and others are speaking from tomorrow. Uh, thanks to Imran also, uh, who is uh, at four in the morning in Pakistan now. One question that has to do with Argentina, that Millet wants to shrink the state. Now, what he really wants to shrink 
He doesn't want to destroy the state. He wants to destroy rights that are uh, guaranteed through the state, rights that have been won through struggle. He wants to, on the contrary, he wants to strengthen the state. Now he, there was a resolution that would allow the police to use lead bullets again and would allow the military forces to repress domestically. So what these people want to do is actually strengthen the bourgeois state to continue guaranteeing that the 1% that benefits from everything continue doing whatever they want. So this guy, he's calling himself an anarcho-capitalist because it sounds nice, but he is strengthening the capitalist state. The other, the other element of the bourgeois state, which is that whole bureaucratic caste. This guy hasn't said ever that uh, these people should win, earn less money. We're seeing all his, you know, family members uh, having positions, earning millions of pesos uh, as a salary. They want to strengthen their own layer of that bureaucracy. O sea, fíjense en la red de todos los que putean, yo me tomo, a mí me putean mil a mil quinientos por día. En las social media, whatever they say. Me da para voltear a quinientos que los que directamente... I have, I get these insults on social media every day. But I see who they are and who versus us. That is, it's all the privileged caste. Because it's not just the bourgeois, they have this buffer of these privileged bureaucrats. That's why the measure of all of the bureaucracy, the state bureaucracy, earning the salary of a worker is so important. We want to destroy it, destroying the, the foundations of that state, that is destroying the armed forces of that state, allowing the masses to have the capacity of defending themselves, of eliminating that buffer of privileged bureaucrats and no politician to earn more than an average worker's wage, want to expropriate the main forces of, of production for production to be a, a collective property. Now, to do that, we need to fight against a apparatus of a bourgeois state that will fight against us attempting to do all of that. And the only way to fight against that is to build a strong revolutionary party in the context of a revolutionary international, which has proven to not be easy. That's why we are still here. There have been possibilities of defeating capitalism, but there have been mistakes, there have been new elements that make things more complex, like what Stalinism has done to taint socialism. How do we explain now? We have to also explain that we have nothing to do with Ortega or Maduro or Stalinism and all of this. But we have to begin from the reality of where are all the experiences taking us that arise from the right and also do not solve any problem, but rather compound them. Now the people will continue resisting and begin to fight against all this. We are optimistic of what we are seeing in the United States. Last year, there was the largest amount of strikes in the United States in the last 50 years. Some of them by the most important sectors of the 
industrial working class, like the automakers that defeated the main automakers of the United States in the United Kingdom as well. There's the recomposition of workers' struggle uh, that is recovering from Thatcher even. Uh, the, the longest railroads in history. So this is what we mean in seeing that the world is polarizing. Reformists will tend to exaggerate one fault of the situation, that is, the rise of the political extreme right. But there is another fault in the situation, which is the rise of struggles, strikes. If, there, if that wasn't happening, we'd be screwed because there would be no possibility of thunder. We have the possibility of advancing because there are struggles. But we need to know that those struggles have a weakness, that they don't have a political pole that represents them. Precisely because this process is just beginning, is that we bet on these organizations, this political representation to rise through the struggle also. A revolutionary political representation that we need to build. And an analogy with the Second World War, because fascism rose when there's crisis, extreme right alternatives always arise because the normal mechanisms of the bourgeoisie fail, the center fails, and now the Second World War, a third of humanity advanced towards expropriating the bourgeoisie. And now if there is an organization, be it small or not, that consciously has the strategy of building this. And we've said here, there isn't a recipe for how to build this party. It's a permanent task. It's not the same in every place. The idiosyncrasies and realities, not the same building in Argentina or in Asia, but we need to bet on building this and building an international because there is no solution in national limits. So I don't know where the revolutionary process will begin. In each country, we need to work for it to begin where we are. But if we take the historic experience of Marxism, of Leninism, of Trotsky's struggle against Stalinism, which is the essence of what the ISL depends, as do other organizations that are not part of the ISL yet, but that we work together with and we're advancing towards working together with to build something that wherever a revolution begins in the world, we have tools to make this advance. Whoever takes the first step somewhere is the beginning of a revolutionary process. Now, revolutions are contagious. The problems the working people have had is not that revolutions don't contagious other countries. The problem we've had is that the people, the leaderships we've had have been dominated by Stalinism, that everywhere did everything possible to avoid the revolution from extending it internationally. Here we had Cuba, who, when there was a revolution in Nicaragua, said, we don't want Nicaragua to be another Cuba, and we don't want El Salvador to be another Nicaragua, a revolution led by real revolutionary forces would transmit the opposing message, the opposite message. It would, from the country we have liberated, it contribute all the resources in our power to help the revolution advance in the rest of other countries. Now, from the historic experience, we know that if there is an, an accumulation of organization, it's very difficult to build it on the spot. 
the German Revolution shows this as well. There were many revolutions in Germany. There was two or three revolutionary moments. But unfortunately, the party did not have the accumulation. They had the confusions. They didn't have what it needed. We have these lessons. We have these conclusions from. That is why we build our organization. That is why we build an international so that we help each other in every country to build revolutionary organizations. That's why we went to Africa and, and organized this Congress with 14 countries participating. That is why we bet on helping build and accumulate these organizations everywhere. So we to do this in the United States. This is going to begin. Now it's part of a political struggle as well, where action in the class struggle is important, but propaganda and explanation, political explanations are also very important discussions on why the party we need to build needs to have a certain characteristic, why that transition from one state to another to one day have communism without state, but to get there, there's a period that is necessary. That's the difference we have with anarchists, for example, who say destroy and not build anything. So the counter-revolution wipes you out. We know that there is a contradiction. We need to build this because we need to have the tools to put up that fight and maintain that struggle. Now, Stalinism, that transition and made it permanent. So we need to build the, the minimum state necessary to confront the bourgeois reaction, but having measures against its consolidation, like making all bureaucrats turn like a worker, but it's the opposite of what Stalin did. We need to kick out of the state all the opportunists who arrived there to have benefits and uh, privileges when the masses were starving. That's why there is an evolution in the political, in the revolutionary theory from Marx to Lenin, from Lenin to Trotsky, because we learned from historical experience, but we need to transmit these lessons, these consequences to vanguard of the mass movement to explain that there's no possibility of reforming capitalism that we need to destroy, that another world is possible without oppression, without exploitation, more democratic than this one, without a state telling you what you have to do. But for that, we need to struggle, because if we don't fight, barbarism is our future because things will not continue as they are today if we don't think if we don't turn things around the bourgeoisie is taking us to barbarism it will be superior exploitation and oppression. that is why people like Malay arise who are expressions of barbarism they, they don't care if half of the people start to death. This is why the future is socialism and barbarism. We have confidence in the class, in the working class. We have confidence that they will struggle, that they will resist. But if there isn't a political subject that builds, and not only builds, nationally, but bets on building an international, we will not be able to prime. Experience teaches us that it's impossible to advance and that it is worth it to do all this and avoid humanity going towards barbarism because we want to improve life for coming generations. This is why we dedicate our lives and our bodies to this. 
There are new imperialist polls. We don't see anything progressive in any of these polls. We don't think a poll of China, Russia, etc., could be progressive in relation to the United States and NATO. We think they are fighting over who will dominate the world to apply similar policies. In Russia, there's a brutal repression, like a dictatorship against any opposition. China never had a democratic um, right. They're advancing without this, and they're going to Africa and other the rest of the world with their uh, new Silk Road. In Russia, we need to discuss with all who are socialists or Marxists about Lenin on self-determination, you know, defending a Russia who is taking 20% of another country. What is rising, we need to see it with a revolutionary perspective. The workers, the only, we can't, workers can't trust in one poll or another imperialist poll is more or less progressive. What we need to put our trust on is in building our revolutionary forces. We can strike together, march together with forces that brought us here in Argentina, for example, against me late today, but independent and with a clear revolutionary program of our own. And the class struggle will have the final word on whether we win or the counter-revolution wins. But it is worth the while, our while to dedicate ourselves to this struggle. Because if we don't advance and win, what we are going towards is more wars, the threat of nuclear war, the destruction of the environment, because the 1% is only interested in accumulating more and more wealth and becoming more and more rich. So the classics are not the dogma, they're a guide to action. And the way to advance is the collective discussion between different organizations, because we need want to build an international organization that is profoundly democratic, that can discuss everything and then act in a united manner. That's Lenin's democratic centralism, not the caricature that Stalinism built with a bureaucratic centralism that tells everyone what to do from top to bottom. And that unfortunately, all of the world's revolutionary left was influenced by this and is the reason why we have many of the problems we have. But we need to learn from our bad experiences, not only the good ones. And so to build a, rev a revolutionary international in which no one tells others what to do in their country, but to help each other in building our organizations and in debating uh, the policies and how to advance and enrich each other. To have a chance at a struggle that is open-ended, that we don't know the outcome of, but it is worth fighting because if we fight, there is a possibility of winning. So that's the determination we need to take and to transmit to the working class. And if we, I'm convinced that if we are able to transmit this to the people that are mobilizing and fighting, many of them will join our revolutionary ranks. And that will bring us closer and closer to a positive 
outcome to the class struggle in the world. So we take this opportunity to reaffirm our compromise to put an end to this shitty society, to have a chance of building a better society where we can all live in abundance and with dignity. The only ones in our way are this small minority. So let's push them out of our out of the way and do what we need to do. Bueno, muchas gracias, compañeras, compañeros. Okay, thank you very much, comrades. We thank Sandra and Imran again, as well as everyone who has watched us online, and we will continue to see each other in this struggle and this process of building.